Hello, students. Welcome to uh, Marketing 3336, Principles of Marketing from the uh, 18th edition of Kotler and Armstrong. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about Chapter 5 uh, and elaborate on the topic of consumer markets and buyer behavior. This is a very interesting topic. And uh, in fact, we have a couple of excellent courses at the University of Houston that elaborate in depth on this particular topic. So I if you find it interesting and you find the area of consumer markets interesting, I really suggest that you pursue uh, this topic more in more depth with one of the other instructors uh, within our department as well. So let's get started today in talking about consumer behavior and buyer behavior. So as we start talking about the topic of consumer behavior and buyer behavior, let's first look at the definition of the way we define con consumer buying behavior. Consumer buying behavior is the buying behavior of final consumers, individuals and households that buy goods and services for personal consumption. Now remember, when we say consumer, this is the individual that's ultimately utilizing that product or service. So it could be at the household level or it could be at the individual level, but they're the actual final users of products and services. So that's what we, when we talk about consumer buying behavior, we look at how this type of individual buys or this household buys. When we talk about consumer markets, they're made up of all the individuals and households that buy or acquire goods for personal consumption within a marketplace for that product or service. So the, the uh, consumer buying behavior looks at the individuals and the behavior of those individuals and the markets aggregates that up and looks at it as, as an aggregate or total across that marketplace. So we're gonna be talking about this, this concept of how consumers buy. And I, I think this is a particularly interesting topic uh, for many of you because many of you have, uh, you know, everybody actually in the class does buying. You, you buy products, you, you are consumers. So let's reflect on this topic, thinking about how we personally consume uh, as we talk about this material today. So this is the, uh, this is the model our book uh, outlines, which is based on a tremendous amount of research within uh, the marketing and consumer behavior field uh, that examines factors affecting the ultimate uh, decision of a buyer to actually buy products. So if we look at the layers of information that go beyond from the most highest influence layer to the more micro influence layer. So if we look at the highest influence layer, we're talking about cultural elements. I'm gonna get into depth into each of these areas, but when we think about culture, culture blanket affects everything downstream and shapes all those things downstream. We next move to social, where we talk about the social element that we reside in within a culture. Then we move to personal, that gets down to the individual unit or group that we work in. And then psychological is our psychological beliefs and motivations down to the individual or the household that then ultimately affect the buyer. So if we look at the phenomenon all the way from the culture, culture drives all the way down and each of these is a hierarchy with, that fits within each other. So as we start to think about the material today, I'd like you to request that you do something. I'd like to, you to think about when you purchased your last smartphone. So when you went out there and actually made the purchase of your last smartphone, uh, the one that you currently have now, um, how did you go about making that purchase? What, what were all the criteria that went into you making that decision? Uh, did others influence that decision or even did others make that decision for you? So I'd like you to think about that in some detail and then reflect on some of the elements that we talk about today and how that could have affected the way you made that decision. And that would affect the way others within markets make that decision as well, too. So let's, let's go through first this uh, cultural element. So when we think about culture, there's three elements to culture. There's overall culture, there's subculture, and then there's social class. We're going to talk about each of those briefly. When we think about culture, culture is a very macro phenomena, and, and, and we're going to see a little clip to talk about how culture affects everything, even downstream personality traits and personality elements. So the culture you're raised in or the culture that you, you, you are part of affects a lot of things relative to the way you make decisions and people within that culture make decisions. 
Then we have what we call our subculture, and then we have our social class. So let's, let's look at a few of these to, to think about this in more depth. So when we think about American culture overall, there's things that are very specific to Americana. We think about the things that Americans in general do. You know, the interesting thing is when we think about culture in America, many might, people might think about the, the homogeneity of the culture in the United States, not knowing the culture, but there's so many pockets of subculture, right, that fall, fall within our American culture. So it's hard to describe us. We have some general characteristics about the American culture itself, but then we can think about the sub-elements of the culture, subgroups that, that fall within that overarching framework of the culture. So a couple things. The average American chews 300 sticks of gum a year. They go to movies nine times a year. They take uh, four trips per year. They attend sporting events on average seven times per year. So these are just a few characteristics about consumption at the cultural level for America that you would see other cultures as well, how they would vary on these kinds of things, and what are norms within that particular culture itself. So the first facet we think about is culture. Then we get down to more specific group within that culture. And this is where it, it really divides up and gets more interesting a little bit. And there are very specific elements to each of these cultures. So we have nationalities. Uh, then we could go down to religious, uh, religious definition of groups. Uh, so if you define yourself in a particular religious group, we could look at racial or, or ethnic groups, and then we could ultimately go down to geographic regions. So, so as we think about these subcultures, let's just get an example of this. I mean, we can obviously think about nationalities or religions or even racial groups, but, but let's think about, for example, geographic regions. I want you to think about differences, for example, in the way pe people might perceive fashion or even, uh, even the way they buy things in general in the Northeast of the United States versus the South, versus the Midwest, versus the West Coast. So let's even think about um, uh, preferences in foods or food consumption and things like that from Texas versus California, uh, versus going up to Massachusetts. So geographic region definitely plays uh, uh, an element of factor to all this, but all of these are what we call subcultures that fit within the overarching culture. I'd like to look at a little video, and I like this video because it particularly outlines uh, how culture itself ultimately affects personality. So we see how culture drives down the overall personality perception, and so let's watch a little video clip about culture and personality. Personality is more than just genes. A large part of who we are and the decisions that we make are influenced by the culture that we grew up in. So where does this influence start? Think all the way back to when you learned manners. You were probably scolded for engaging in behavior that was considered rude in your culture. Conversely, you were probably encouraged to engage in behaviors that are considered to be polite. Now, as you were conditioned to engage in more polite behaviors, you subconsciously picked up on patterns that influenced how you behave. These patterns are highly influenced by the values of the culture that you grew up in. But not all cultures hold the same values. Some cultures tend to encourage behaviors that are loud, boisterous, and competitive. Others encourage quiet, respectful, and more humble behaviors. Depending on the culture where you live, you probably picked up on these values and they have definitely influenced your decisions and your personality. Researchers have been studying the connections between culture and personality for a long time. And in this video, I'm going to attempt to explain two spectrums that researchers have created to define cultures. The culture's place on these spectrums highly influences the personality traits and the behaviors of the people within that culture. So culture is not determined by borders. As you'll see throughout the rest of this video, people learn lessons from cultures that are created from people within a certain country, occupation, class, gender identity, or other differences. For example, just because the country you live in has an individualist culture does not mean you are bound by individualist ideas. So keep this in mind throughout the rest of the video. Let's get started by talking about individual versus collectivist culture. Individualism focuses on the individual, just as the name implies. People living in an individualist environment prioritize self-improvement of themselves and satisfying their own needs before the rest of those of their community. Why? Well, individualist cultures believe and teach that if everyone takes care of themselves, then the entire group should thrive and then become self-sufficient. Individualist cultures put a lot of stress on independence and self-reliance. Those that live in this type of 
culture tend to be very self-sufficient and driven workers, but are weaker whenever it comes to collaboration and teamwork. They usually struggle handing off responsibility. Now, in general, these people usually distance themselves psychologically and emotionally from one another, since working with others is more of an option than a requirement for success. In the media, we often see individualist characteristics associated with men, people in urban settings, and the Western culture. So what about collectivist cultures? People living in a collectivist environment are taught to focus on the needs of the group before they focus on their own individual needs. They associate their identity to the role and function in a larger group. These groups can include families, teams at work, or the entire nation. Collectivist societies teach people that everyone will benefit when they start to look out for one another. Harmony and interdependence between group members is highly valued among people in this type of environment. Now, unlike their individualist counterparts, members of collectivist cultures tend to be extremely close to each other psychologically and emotionally. Now, this can create an us versus them mindset that separates or looks down upon people that are outside of their group. Collectivist characteristics are generally associated with women, people in rural settings, and Eastern culture. So let's look at another spectrum. So before we move on to the next spec, the for the next spectrum, um, let's think about this individualist versus collectivist culture. And you know, one of the things that we've been reflecting on a lot in the United States lately is uh, adherence to principles or general phenomena. And one of the things that we see, for example, even with mask wearing behaviors, we see a lot of research that's been done out there that shows that there's going to be a difference between more of a collectivist culture in the way that people rally together and work versus individualist. The United States tends to be an individualistic culture in general. So some of the researchers have found phenomena, for example, the mask wearing to be more difficult uh, during things like COVID crisis and stuff like this, where in a collectivist culture, people tend to follow a phenomena to, to work together to worry about each other and things of this nature. So you see that type of principle playing out even in some of the phenomena and behaviors that we're seeing today in in different uh, cultural marketplaces. Did you grow up in an approach or an avoidance culture? This idea was coined in 1935 to help psychologists identify what makes some conflicts easy to resolve and others difficult to resolve. Where you lie on this spectrum can highly influence how you make decisions. So what is approach versus avoidance? Humans typically want to approach and move towards pleasurable things, and they typically want to avoid and move away from negative or painful things. It's very similar to Freud's pleasure pain principle. The idea of approach versus avoidance was measured when an experiment was conducted on rats in 1948. The rats were exposed to different positive and negative stimuli. Researchers then measured the strength of their pull towards the stimuli. The most interesting results from this experiment revealed that the closer the rats were to the item that they were either approaching or avoiding, the stronger their pull was in either direction. Now this can be applied to humans and how they make their decisions and categorize conflict. But what does it have to do with the culture where you grew up with? Because that's kind of the topic of this video, right? The culture helps to teach you at a young age what to approach and what to avoid. Culture doesn't teach you to avoid physical pain and approach food. Those things are instinctual to all humans. The things we learn to approach and avoid through culture appeal to a higher need. One example of this is something called uncertainty avoidance. The uncertainty avoidance of a culture is a measure of how that culture responds to novelty and uncertainty. How does a culture deal with ambiguity? Are changes welcome in the nation? Or does the culture approach stable traditional rules and customs? Now in some research I found that countries who generally score high in eroticism tend to be high in uncertainty avoidance. Those countries usually have a more formal system of rules that try to minimize cultural or situational ambiguity, and the citizens are uninterested in changing them. These cultures tend to be more conservative, more emotional, and usually xenophobic. Families in these cultures tend to have more traditional gender roles too. Schools have more structured learning, and children are taught to trust that their teachers have all of the answers. Children are also taught that the outside world may be a hostile place. Religions associated with the uncertainty avoidance include Catholicism, Islam, Judaism, and Shintoism. Conversely, countries low in neuroticism and low in uncertainty avoidance tend to have fewer laws and regulations, and their citizens are much more interested in politics. These cultures are often more open to change and more tolerant of diversity, and people within these cultures tend to suppress their emotions more. Families in these cultures usually have looser gender roles, and their schools have a more open-minded learning. As a generality, teachers are allowed to say that they don't know, and students are encouraged to question 
question authority. Children are also taught that the outside world is benevolent and that they should not persecute others based on their beliefs. Religions associated with low uncertainty avoidance include Protestantism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Hinduism. So where do you fit in? Uncertainty avoidance is just one concept that is influenced by a culture's personality and how it influences the decisions and behaviors of the people within that culture. What were you taught to avoid? What were you taught to approach? And how does the culture where you grew up in influence what you consider to be comfortable and uncomfortable? I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you Okay, so so that gives you a pretty good idea of uh, some of the things around cultural facets and dimensions of culture. Uh, you know, he he's uh, uh, leading it uh, more towards a psychological phenomena, a uh, pure psychological, but you can see where these types of elements apply in culture to the way we form ideas and perceptions, as well as to the way in which we respond to novelty and novel uh, response elements as well. So this actually is a very interesting, I think, uh, concept of really understanding where people facilitate or decide on cultural elements and how it influences their decisions. So let's subside, subside, subside within the cultural is the social element. And we think about social, this is groups and social networks, family and roles and status. So, so example, groups and social networks. Could be groups that we're a member of, uh, for example, uh, or a social network that we're a member of. It could be a club, so, so a country club that we're a member of. It could be a fraternity or sorority. Uh, it could be a social club. Any of these kinds of things uh, affect the way we make decisions because we're part of a group that influences the way we think about things. That's social. We can get to family. Of course, our family affects us in the way that we 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 work or we think. And then ultimately also our roles and status within the groups, uh, our social groups that we stand. Are we a leader or a follower in that social group or do we fall within that social hierarchy? So as we think about this stuff and we think about social and group networks, let's think about some really interesting things with regard to the way in which uh, individuals purchase or buy. So one is what we call membership groups. So that is, um, if, I'm a, if I'm a group, and I, I, I alluded to this earlier, talked about it a second ago, which is like my fraternity or sorority. If I'm a member of a fraternity or sorority, and I have all kinds of friends who are also commonly members of that fraternity or sorority, and I think about working with them and, and doing things with them and having fun with them, oftentimes I'm influenced by those individuals on what I want to consume, what type of jewelry I want to wear, uh, what type of clothing would be acceptable. All those kind of things define or help us define what we call our membership group. Another thing that we have is what we call our aspirational groups. These are groups that we would like to be a member of in the future or, or perceive that this is a group that we would really like to fit in with. We're not part of that group now, but we'd like to be part of that group now. And that, that can be things like, for example, it could be a social club that we would always wanted to be a member of. Uh, it could be some sort of elite group or, or elite membership, like a think tank or, or, or a, uh, some sort of a, a elite membership club. Uh, it could be like an honor society, or it could be any type of aspirational group that we aspire to be part of. It could be a yacht club, for instance, if it's a wealth-based factor. But uh, individuals are often, uh, often influenced by the aspirational groups that they, they want to be in. So they try to emulate those groups and think about those groups as, as ones that they would, uh, would want to be part of. And lastly, reference groups. Reference groups are groups that form comparative reference in the forming attitudes or behaviors. So a reference group could be a positive reference group or it could be a negative reference group. So oftentimes we think about things in positive frame. Let's think about it in negative. So we could say we don't want to identify with that particular group. So that's a reference group we think about. So, for example, if we're a Democrat and we want to look against the Republicans, that may be a reference group that we try to oppose that group, or for a Republican, and we uh, oppose Democrats. It could be also uh, the fact that there could be a more controversial groups uh, that we want to be part of or we don't want to be part of. Uh, so if we think about these kinds of things, that these types of group memberships or group formations affect the way that which we make decisions uh, and our social bases within these decisions. 
Of course, we can think about our family. That's obvious that our family affects decisions. Just think about the last time our family members bought cars. Uh, the entire family often will be involved uh, in a car decision. Uh, and it's very, there are many decisions where the family gets, in, in, in fact, involved in the whole decision, house buying, car buying, anything of major significance. Uh, and, and of course, they influence a lot of the daily decisions that people make. The next, we have roles and status. At what role, what role or status? Am I a leader within the group or am I more a follower within the group? I'll give you a really good example of role status kind of things. We know that, uh, that, that, that kids in high school and junior high school are heavily influenced by role status factors. Uh, so, for example, one of the things that photographers will often do, if you think about your high school, they might have done this, is they'll pick out some of the more popular kids in the school and they'll offer them to do photography for them. And then they'll put their photography all over the social media. You see how great their pictures look. And then you might say, uh, mom, dad, I want my pictures done by this social media, pro uh, this, this photographer, because they look wonderful. So a lot of it is getting part of an aspirational group. And that, that sometimes gets into the role status influence factors as well. So that's our social. Now let's get down to the personal uh, uh, characteristics. This is where we get into age and lifestyle or where we are in a life, ci life cycle stage. So we think about age and life cycle stage. It could be that you know we're young, uh, we're independent, we start to be, get more of a family formation later on possibly, uh, we, we're a working professional later. It could be that we're middle age, we have uh, more formed social norms older class or upper, uh, and we look at different stages of our life stage and where we are on things. Occupation, uh, economic situation, where we are economically. Uh, are we, uh, do we have a lot of money? Do we just have a little bit? Are we, uh, are we strapped as far as debt? Things like this. Um, we get to our lifestyle decisions and personality and self-concept. I'm going to talk a little bit about the latter two because they're not as obvious as some of the things like age, occupation, and economics. Those are, those are more obvious. So let's think about lifestyle. Lifestyle is a person's pattern of a living expressed in his or her psychographics. I'm going to show you a little clip on this concept of psychographics here in a minute to talk about how, how you know, above and beyond an individual's demographics, that is descriptors about them like age, gender, um, and uh, geography, there's going to be things that are called psychographics and the way they believe or beliefs and the way they live that affect their lifestyle, that can affect their purchase consumption behaviors. We're also going to think about our personality characteristics. Like, uh, for example, um, what is our personality like? How do we express ourselves? What, what is that unique to ourself about our own personality? So let's watch a little video clip, clip about what we call psychographic segmentation. You've probably heard of demographics before. Demographics include information about how old people are, their gender, where they live, their level of education, and what industry they work in. If you know this information, you can market differently to various segments of your customers or potential buyers. But what conclusions can you really draw from demographics? Imagine you sell candles. These two people bought the same candle. One of them is a 25-year-old woman. The other is also a woman, but 65 years old. One lives in the Arizona desert. The other lives in coastal California. There isn't really a good way to market differently to these two people. We may try to make assumptions, but we don't really know why either of them are interested in candles. That's where psychographic segmentation comes in. Psychographics focuses more on why someone buys. For example, someone doesn't buy a candle just because they're a woman. But if you've learned that some of the women who buy your candles use them in home decorating, others buy them for gifts, and yet others simply enjoy the fragrance, now we can start to think about how we might speak to each desire differently. It's easy to assume you know why someone bought your product or services, but without knowing for sure, your messaging might not resonate with your customers. Say you think people buy your candles because of the high quality wick and you focus on that in your website and in your marketing materials, but many of your customers are buying for decoration and don't even burn the candle. You may be missing a lot of potential customers. An easy place to start is simply asking your customers what experience they want, what's important to them, what do they do in their free time, and how do they use your product. 
but be careful not to mistake a couple conversations for data that represents all of your customers. To get a wider view, try doing some keyword research to see what people are searching for online, monitoring social media conversations, or looking at reviews. To get really in-depth, consider sending a survey to your customers. Explain that you want to understand them better and make sure that the information you send them is relevant. When you send it to them, include options to rank what matters most, like scent, cost, or appearance, and also include open-ended questions like, why do you buy candles? Now you're well on your way to personalizing marketing for different segments of your customers. If you All right. So you get a little bit of a feel there for, uh, for how... Uh, we think about this concept of psychographics and the differences and effects of psychographics within decision making. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a good example for us to think about this psycholog- uh, psychographic segmentation. Uh, so let's ultimately get at the last part, which we, what we call a psychological phenomena. And this is, a, this is the psychological element, like how motivated we are. What are some of our perceptions? Uh, what, how, have we lear- how, how do we learn? What are some of our beliefs and attitudes? This gets to our core psychological phenomena and the way we work individually that then affects the buyer behavior. So if we think about this phenomena, we've moved all the way from the culture down to the social, down to the personal, down to the psychological, and then ultimately that affecting the buyer. So I, I want to talk a little bit about when we focus on this uh, that element and, and we think about this, the last element I really want to bring up is this idea of how people adopt innovation or new products. And this is a particularly important element with regard to consumer uh, behavior and consumption patterns. Let's go back to that cell phone example that we've been talking about today and thinking about, I hope you've been thinking about as we went through all this criteria, how each of these is affected uh, the consumption decisions of your cell phone. Uh, th- that's a lot of stuff. And we, we're thinking at a very high level and we're getting to the very micro level about the individual. Now let's think about things like innovativeness uh, of, of when we adopt. Let's think about those individuals that fall within these categories of when a new innovative device comes out. So let's, let's say that when Apple innovates or comes out with or is about to come out with their the really new version of a uh, of a cell phone, and that gets launched into the marketplace. Well, I want to do is talk about the stages of adoption of that innovation that hits that marketplace. So, what we found is that there are patterns of adopters as things go on, and each of these individuals, depending on when they adopt, of course, have different things that are important to them. So, let's think about a person adopting cell phones across these categories. The first part is what we call the innovators. So when that cell phone comes out, these are the first 2.5% of people that go and get that smartphone that comes out into the market. So if Apple comes out with an extremely innovative new product, there's individuals that are going to get that right the day it comes out or just before it comes out. These are called innovators. Let's think about these innovators. What influences a person to make a decision as an innovator? Uh, You know, obviously, these are people who want things right away. They want to be on top of the most uh, impactful technology. They probably know the markets inside out. So there's a unique differences of these individuals that we call innovators. Think about how we would market to these people. Next, based on those innovators, the next stage is what we call our early adopters. And early adopters are that next 13.5% that buy those products right after those really rapid first couple day innovators. So think about those early adopters of those cell phones. These are the ones that just get out there and maybe not get it in the first day, but in the first week that something comes out like the cell phone, they get on top of it, they buy it, they want this product, they want to be part of it. Now, the really interesting thing about this is these are individuals that are probably technologically savvy, but they're not the level of technological savviness of an innovator. Um, They may be an individual that really likes new stuff and follows it, but not person who's at the height of knowledge of the marketplace itself or wants to be on top of that phenomenon or prides himself to be part of it. Let's move to the next, which is the early mainstream. Now, these are individuals who want to be usually part of a trend. That's 34%. So these are those who they think it's important to have new technology, new innovation 
to be part of what they do. It often is part of their identity. They don't want to be individuals that are late to adopt things or late to, uh, to uptake. Think about those individuals who would buy a cell phone. We have next what we call the late mainstream. These are individuals who are still want to be part of it, but they are very late to act. They sort of are forced into this action. And then ultimately, we have what's called the lagging adopters. And these are individuals who wait till the last minute where their old cell phone potentially or their old, their old smartphone is not being able to handle things properly. So they are ultimately the ones who adopt. Think about those individuals that fall in this category. Do you know friends or family that fall within each of these categories? Where would they be and what's the differences in the way they buy and they would, they, uh, the way they would be influenced by marketing campaigns? All right. So that's our material for today. I hope you found it interesting uh, and uh, I look forward to talking to you uh, next class.